This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. All right, Exodus 9, starting with verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels and oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous moraine, and the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel's. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh said, said, And behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to your handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it upward, uh, up toward heaven, and it became a, a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils the boil was upon the magicians and all upon all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out mine hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt cut off from the earth, be cut off from the earth, excuse me. And in the very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may Declared, be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such hath not uh, been in Egypt since the foundation, even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that uh, thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast with uh, which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home. The hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. He that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand, toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of, uh, land of Egypt, upon man, and upon beast, and upon every er herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran along the, upon the ground. 
and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And all the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, uh, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field, and break every tree of the field. Um, that's got to be pretty substantial to be breaking trees up, you know. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time, i.e. like you never sinned before, really. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I have sinned this time. Uh, I lost my spot. I did, yeah. Uh, the Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord. For it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go. And ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread upon my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was, bo uh, was bald. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hand unto the Lord. And the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. Um, and th when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. We'll pray and we'll jump into this here. Lord, we thank you for this text as we've read it here this morning. and We just ask that you would help open our hearts and minds to truth. May we see and understand the story and the significance that it carries for the children of Israel and also for our own lives as well. In your son's name, amen. Long, a uh, kind of a long chapter, <laughs> but uh, we kind of get here the, we've already had the first plague with water turned to blood, then we had the frogs, we had the lice, we had the flies, We've had the disease on the livestock is what we're starting in now with the fifth plague. Um, it says cattle, but the word for cattle in Hebrew covers basically any animal you would keep as part of um, an agricultural lifestyle. You know, anything that you're planning to eat or whatnot. So this could include everything from, from sheep to goats to donkeys, camels, you know, it, it's a very wide, very wide, um, term. So cattle, I'm not going to say it's a bad translation, but it's, it's just not, it's not as broad as maybe the term can be used. Uh, so livestock may be a, a more broad term to use with that. A uh, moraine, when was the last time you heard that word used? A grievous moraine. Apparently, it was a common term in the Middle Ages. So I'm kind of wondering, with the King James being translated in 1611, I'm wondering if it still had some usage there in England. Um, but it, it's just basically some sort of disease or plague. And plague is, is a good... It's a good one for it because if we think about it, today we might isolate different things. We have bird flu, we have I mean, the swine flu, we have, we, we isolate and we recognize all the different strains of something. Um, whereas this is just, think bubonic plague. I mean, <laughs> it's just massive scale. Um, so, and, and it's, this is one of three times in scripture that this is causing death on a, on a widespread scale. So, uh, it's substantial, and if you think about it, 
our current society is getting more and more away from agriculture, but what would this have done to an ancient society? Yeah. Well, and today, there's some way you have some insurance sometimes on some of that, but you still take a loss, but there was no insurance companies back then. I mean, I guess we don't have record of insurance companies. And it would be devastating, not just for the individual farmers and ranchers, but then for the whole economy. Because then other people who would be normally buying that for food or, or whatnot, what are they going to get? You know, and... Yeah, yeah, and it just it just completely... Yeah, and what happens when things get really scarce? Prices go up, but also you tend to have more riots. <laughs> I'm just, you know, this is... And if you think about it, I mean, just, just stop and think. Go back to the Genesis story with Joseph. God miraculously provided for the Egyptians when everybody else in the area was famished, you know, in a famine. And here, when the Egyptians have now risen on an evil scale, and they're doing evil, now he's cutting back, and where once before they were blessed through Joseph, uh, now they're, they're experiencing curses and devastation and these plagues. This is where... Um, again, we have a clear-cut distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. This is the, the second time this is observed. Um, I have a note here. Domesticated animals were treasured as enormously valuable assets in biblical times, as in prior to the Industrial Revolution, or in any place even today where farming uh, predominates. Moreover, they were seen as closely interrelated to the welfare of humans, a fact reflected even by the Bible's creation account. Remember, they were made on the same day. For them to have lost livestock would constitute a serious blow indeed. For them to have lost livestock while the Israelites remained, all theirs represented a nationwide humiliation. So you have here Egyptians are losing their livestock, but when they're looking across the fence at the Israelites, what do they see? Healthy stuff. And, and then, then there's another interesting question, and it kind of takes us back to Moses, his early part when he was born. So, um, they, they would bar, or I'm sorry, it doesn't take a step back, it takes us forward. When they're about to leave Egypt, it says, Moses tells them to go borrow, you know, things of, from their neighbors. Well, that kind of sounds like the Israelites were somewhat integrated with some of the Egyptians. If you think about it, because you wouldn't, I don't know, I guess you could, but especially if you're walking, you wouldn't go to Wheatland or Torrington to go borrow something from somebody unless it's, you know, really rare. Or, I mean, we might with vehicles, but you wouldn't do it probably walking. Um, so it sounds like they're integrated, but there was a clear-cut distinction between, okay, here's an Egyptian's cattle, here's mine, or er, an Israelite's. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here is in verse 5, um, so the Lord sets the time. Does that ring any bells? This is the fifth plague. Yes. And what plague was that on? No, it was it was the frogs. So you remember how we said like the first three kind of go in a pair? You start to pay attention to the, the next three, so five is going to kind of match some of the things in two and how it gets written. Which brings up a, a question that's worth discussing. Is this history or is this just a theological message. And I'm saying yes. <laughs> okay? 
Because, okay, if if I told if I told the story of how my wife and I ended up in Guernsey, as we told that story, we would lace it with things like, and the Lord led here, or this happened, and and that this happened that was unique. You know what I'm saying? And we would we would articulate it that way. But if you were a outside observer who didn't believe in God, you'd say, well, this, this, this. You know, you you'd see the objective. So when Moses is writing this, he's not writing and making up new history. He's not writing and writing just a theology book, and he's not simply writing Israel's black and white history. He's writing them together as in he's weaving these stories in such a way that they're really intricately designed literature but they're still telling a real story. Does, does that make sense? Be like if um, I told the story of how my wife and I got together, and then my wife told the story, it would come out different. But it's still the same story. Do you see what I mean? And there might be different emphasis. So um, I say that this book uh, has a lot in it that critical scholars, and by that I don't mean people who think critically, I mean people who... Um, disbelieve any sort of involvement from God on the inspiration of Scripture, they like to try to tear this whole thing apart. Like, well, that this couldn't happen. It's like, you guys are missing the point. All right, um, Just because Moses um, is writing this with a very good literary structure doesn't mean these things didn't happen. Um, anyway, there's my hobby horse, I guess. So this parallels where now God sets the time Whereas back with the frogs, Pharaoh set the time. So there's a, you're not getting an option this time, Pharaoh. I'm doing it, you know. So um, number four here, all the livestock of the Egyptians died. Verse six. This brings up a bit of a sticky wicket. Anybody want, anybody can, can you spot the sticky wicket here? If all of the Egyptians cattle died. Okay, there's that, and that's displaying that's displaying God's power. But what what sticky wicket do you think skeptics bring up with this here? It's really not that complicated, but okay, it didn't make that happen. But what they're going to point out and be skeptical of is you have hail. Killing, why would, why would this disease on the livestock kill all of their cattle, or all of their livestock, and then in the next section, hail's killing them? You don't... On li yeah, so if it's on man and beast... What beast were their left? Exactly. So any thoughts? I found a really good article. I didn't include maybe, it. Maybe they were non-Egyptian and non israelite people in there and some of those cattle. Maybe. I mean, it's said the Egyptian cattle was on but maybe there was... Kind of some mixed things going on. Or maybe it was the livestock cattle, Christian people that had cattle. That didn't. Yeah. What were you saying, babe? Or maybe it was... Oh, that still survived. So after I got the handout done, Answers in Genesis has a really good article on this on their website, and they give five reasonable responses to this. Um, I don't remember all five. I'm going to go with the ones I have in the handout <laughs> first. Um, if the cattle all died in the plague, how can one explain the presence of animals later in verse 10 and of the livestock in verses 20 and 21? Two explanations are possible. 
i.e. actually there's five, but anyway, according to this commentator, there's two. The word all may be employed hyper, uh, hyperbol hy hyper hyperbolically. There we go, that's it. It's the exaggeration for effect. Um, as a figure of speech or large quantity without meaning the totality of livestock. Okay, that's a possibility. I, I shy away from that one because I think there's better explanations. Um, a better explanation is that the plague killed all the animals in the field, but not those in the shelter. Well, that's what I thought we had from the hail, but the disease one wouldn't really distinguish between field and shelter. Yeah. But, but that could... Right, that one could carry into when it comes to the hail and then the next plague where there's, you know, boils. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you have to realize... And there's a, there's a hint here that these plagues are not like boom, 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 one day after another. And part of that hint is in... Um, in this passage with the crops towards the end where the flax and the barley were smitten, but the um, wheat and rye were not, that's because of the timing of the, the agricultural cycles. And and so there's one crop is destroyed where, where later there's got to be something for the locusts to come in to eat. So you can have months in here going on together. That's, that's not a huge problem. Um, another explanation from another commentator here is the Hebrew word kol, and i probably not pronouncing that right, usually translated at all, can mean all sorts of, or from all over, or all over the place. Now that seems to make sense too. Whereas you're saying all the cattle died, like literally like all over the place. Everywhere you go, there's dead cattle. There's dead livestock everywhere. And not that every single one died. And so what we have here is, is sometimes, sometimes if we're not careful, we, we, we can let skeptics pull some of this stuff up. And then because of the English, they're all dead. We think the word all means all, and that's all all means, right? And that's not actually the case. <laughs> Another, another illustration of this would be um, you get to the story of Esther with Agag and the Amalekites and um, Haman being an Amalekite or an Agagite, sorry. And early on, in, you read that the Amalekites were wiped out. Every last one was destroyed. So would you expect to see any more Amalekites? Right. But see, that's kind of what happens is Saul then wipes out the Amalekites and then David wipes out the Amalekites and then David later is still fighting Amalekites. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm not saying we shouldn't trust our Bible, but sometimes when we try to push the English word meaning of the word all on some of the Hebrew, it doesn't fit and work that way, if that makes sense. And so it's still devastating. Pharaoh goes out and he observes this. He investigates it and he hardens his heart. And could you imagine being in his shoes where you see your people and their property and it's destroyed? I mean, maybe not, maybe they had, an individual had 10 cows and they lost five or six, you know, and that's, that's a huge problem. And then you see the Israelites and they didn't lose anything. You know, I mean, that's that type of thing. It's screaming to Pharaoh that God's judgment is upon him and his people. And he's not having it. Um, he hardens his heart again here in verse Seven, um, Ipis was the was a bull or sacred animal of the god Put, 
um, or Hathor, goddess of love, and it was often represented by the cow. So this plague may have been against these a couple of these Egyptian deities. Could have been God again, kind of. Yeah, you. Th- you think you got this turf under control? Nah, God's got it all under control. Uh, the sixth plague, then. This begins uh, pretty much here in uh, verse 8 with the boils. Now, uh, verse in chapter, or the, fir- the plague 5 here, he goes to Pharaoh. Um, this one with the boils, uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, Take your hand, ashes of the furnace. They do it in his sight. So they're going. You get into some of the guys who are translating the Hebrew, and, and basically they're carrying the sense here of they're not going necessarily in the palace, but they're going to where they're positioning themselves in a place where they know Pharaoh's going to see them do this. And they are, are taking dust of the ground, throwing it in the air, or not dust of the ground, they're taking ashes from a furnace of some sort. They're throwing it into the air. Um, and the the word here is it, it's the idea of they're like doing this several times with with handfuls. They're making a lot of this. Um, the dust or the ashes turn to boils. Um, this this also it stopped. It's worth mentioning. There's a transformation that God does several times in these stories. So he, remember the serpent, the rod to a serpent. You have the hand to a leprous and not. Uh, this is another one of those uh, transformation things, the water to blood. Um, so that's kind of a, a motif or, th- or uh, theme that keeps running through this. God is in charge of everything, and he can mo- manipulate or change things of the natural world. He's the maker of it. The boils, uh, it's also worth noting here, this isn't simply like a bruise. The Some of the more graphic translations probably get it better, where they say putrefying sores. So like these are unhealable. These are um, oozing. Almost like, yeah, yeah, these are really bad. And whatever it was, it affected man and beast. So whether this is a form of anthrax or, or skin something we we don't know and again we can't impose on the hebrew thinking and language the modern scientific terms but something here it's incredibly painful so much so that these magicians are unable to stand before pharaoh now you know it's one thing not to go to work when you're sick but when uh when your boss is the king and in charge, and the top dog, and he's calling you in, you, you'd probably try to at least report. And these guys are so out of it, they can't even stand before Pharaoh. So um, this is where... He, he, these are the guys who, they have contact with the quote-unquote gods of Egypt. They are trying to manipulate and use these gods. And now they're being shown as utterly useless. And again, Pharaoh's heart is hardened in verse 12. But it's worth noting, this is the first time in the entire story where it says God hardened his heart. If you look through all the other instances up to this point, it's either Pharaoh hardened his heart, or it says his heart grew hard, but this is the first time where it says God hardened his heart. Now, did God say he would harden his heart? Yeah, back at burning bush. Yeah, back on the road. God told this to Moses that I will do this. But up until this point, had God had to harden his heart? Yeah, so... so yeah, he, he's got his his props, you know, the thing kind of keeping him up. So he hadn't, 
he had already been hardening his heart or his allowing his heart to grow hard. Um, and here, God allows him um, to harden it even more. Uh, I thought I had a quote here, and maybe that's... Oh, okay. Bottom of page 5, I'm going to jump ahead. I really like the way this was said. God is using his power to lure evil Pharaoh to his own destruction. God didn't force Pharaoh to harden his heart. But once Pharaoh over and over and over hardens his heart, now God allows, not just allows, but God actively hardens his heart. So the more evil Pharaoh becomes, the more of an example of God's justice Pharaoh will also become. Um, so uh, it's just worth noting, this is the first time in all the plagues, I mean, this is the sixth plague, more than halfway through, and this is where God actively steps in and hardens the heart. Uh, top of page five, this was simply in pursuance of God's universal method of dealing with men. God's universal method is if men or man, if a man chooses error, to give him up to err. If with a stout heart they choose sin, at last he gives them over to sin. This is a stern dealing, but it is a just dealing. It's, it's the idea of over and over here, you want this, you want this, you want this, and God finally says, fine, you can have it. I know it's bad for you. I know it's going to hurt you. I know it's not, it's not what would be beneficial for you, but you are so dead fixed on it. You want this. He lets you have it. And then that becomes the tool of your own destruction. Um, and sometimes we can, we can do this in our own lives, maybe not to the same extent, but we're so fixated on this or that thing or person or whatever that we, we, we don't listen to the Lord, and then finally that thing, that job, that whatever, it just becomes a source of, of destruction for our own lives. Um, uh, also, this plague was against possibly Ahimotep, uh, the venerated god of learning and medicine. Here's the Egyptian god and his, his cronies, the magicians, can't even... He's the god of healing, and they can't get him to heal these boils. So, comments or questions before we go to the last plague? Here? Well, I would think so, but apparently I kind of wonder if they weren't as bad. Or, the text doesn't say, you know. But these plagues were affecting his whole household. And so you wonder if, let's, let's put it this way, if Pharaoh's laying in bed with boils... He could still be issuing orders to other people to do stuff. So, it you don't know, you know. But another thing worth considering here, um, and this was new to me this week because I was listening to some material on this. How do we use the term White House in our culture and setting? When I... Okay. So, so it's the physical location of where a president lives. But there's times we can refer to it and refer to the president. There's times we could refer to the White House and we could mean his administration, you know, all the different people working around his cabinet that works for him. Or the building, or the specific president, or his administration. And you might hear it used as broad as just the entire government, you know, although not so much with the other branches. But there's some discussion here with the term Pharaoh that at different points in history, that term Pharaoh was kind of used that way. So it points in this narrative, yes, there is a key guy in charge. And this is a monarchy, so he's the only one in charge. But Everybody does what he says. But there's also his administration. And so it's not just him that's hardening his heart, but there's points where it, it could possibly be those in his staff. 
But we do have hints here in the passage because like here with the, the hail that comes, there are those who fear the Lord and the word of Moses, Egyptians who they get their cattle in. You know, they, there are those who, who are how is it, responding rightly to the judgment of God. Um, so anyway, the seventh plague here is hail, and there's a message for Pharaoh. Uh, the previous plagues could have really destroyed Egypt, but God is not done showing his power. It's kind of interesting wording here in verses 14 to 15. It says, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For I will now stretch out mine hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. Now as I'm reading this, I see pestilence. I'm like, wait, I thought this was about hail. Um, this is kind of a summary statement of what's happened so far. It says here, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart. Um, the way that sounds to us in English is like in the future. But in Hebrew, you don't have past, present, and future tenses. You have... Um, and I had, a, I, had a kid, I had to do some reading in Hebrew on this to figure out what's going on. Um, but you have a, a completed tense and an incompleted tense. So completed is something that's done and accomplished, but the completed incomplete means it, it's kind of ongoing. So it's not, it started, but it's not finished. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Um, and the point is he's displaying his power. He's saying that you're going to know nobody's like me in all the earth. Uh, and he says, I will stretch out my, out my hand and smite the people with pestilence. And now shall be cut off from the earth. God could have allowed the plague so far to destroy them. God could have brought one plague and just destroyed him. He could have done that. But he's he's using the different tools in his tool bag. I, I, mean, I don't know if that sounds good, but he's using different ways to do it so that each way he does it, he's just showing another way that he is the God who's in control. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's kind of the, the motif or the theme over and over and over. They can do nothing against the hand of the Lord. And again, this is a very ancient type of thinking, and this comes up later in Israel's history, where even under a wicked king, their enemies say, well, he's a god of the... Uh, he's a god of the hills, so we're going to fight in the plain, or a god of the plain, so we're going to fight in the hills. And God allows the Israelites to win, not because they're right with him and not because they're doing what they're supposed to, but God allows that to happen simply so this other nation knows that, nope, nope, I'm not just the god of the plain, I'm the god of the hills, too, you know. So this type of localized, specialized deities. Um, God is just blowing all that out of the water. These uh, these gods that Egypt serves, they're nothing. And and again, as we've been going through these plagues, I've been linking different plagues to different deities. You will not find one codified list of this that everybody agrees on. Because I'm like, well, I think this plague is against this deity or that deity. And so there's... There's some variation there. Uh, but the point is, God's, whatever deity it is, whether we link that right or wrong, it doesn't matter. God's thwarting every single one of them. Um, and so he's doing it in quite a spectacular way. Um, wow. Well, I better stop there for time. 
we'll just kind of pick up and review that again right at the hill next week, and we'll go from there. Comments or questions? You didn't make it. So, so one one way that it gets translated by some people working on the Hebrew is now I am stretching out my hand. And if you think about it, he has been stretching out his hand. He's continuing to put his hand against Egypt. Does that make make sense? So it's an ongoing. They're in the middle of these ten plagues of judgment. It's an ongoing thing here, and so. Um, yeah, Pharaoh once again hardens his heart, and you'd think that booger would learn his lesson. Yeah, but yet we're often stubborn too. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to be honest, and even the children of Israel, they get out of Egypt and they're whining. You know, well, yeah. I mean, seriously. Come on. So, anyway, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the story here in, in Scripture. And Lord, as we covered these plagues, Lord, you've, you are demonstrating your power in magnificent ways to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians, and to the nations around them. And Lord, we ask that as... If Pharaoh hardened his heart, would we not be like him? Would we not harden our own hearts? As Paul writes in Second Thessalonians and in Romans 1, we ask that you would not allow us to get to the point where you turn us over to our own desires. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.